The road is long, there are mountains in our way, but yet we'll climb still higher every day. If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you if you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way 
There's a place for people like you. I've heard up there the streets are made of gold. And when you get there, there's a hand to hold. I believe when your days down here are through, there's a place up there for people like you. If you walk around with your heart on your sleeve, and if you're trying to be the change you want to see, if you lay down your life for love so someone could be saved, there's a place for people like you. are made of gold And when you get there There's a hand to hold I believe When your days down here are through There's a place Up there For people like you
If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you If you stand up for those down on their knees And lend a voice to those who cannot speak If you shine a little light, give sight to the ones who've lost their way There's a place for people like you I've heard up there the streets are made of gold And when you get there, there's a hand to hold When your day's down here or through There's a place up there for people like you If you walk around with your heart on your sleeve And if you're trying to be the change you want to see If you lay down your life for a love so someone could be saved a place for people like you. I've heard up there the streets are made of gold. And when you get there, there's a hand to hold. I believe when your days down here or through, there's a place up there. For people like you
front. Bless God, they will know, for they shall be comforted. He promised never to leave you nor to save you. So I want to reassure you of his presence. We're going to begin this service by the singing of the hymn, Father Alone. Uh, it's in your program, she, we're going to join our voices together as we go a cappella in singing this hymn. We'll go after three, one, two, three. Ten, ten, and
Certainly we look forward to the day that we have the chance to understand the perplexities of this life. To understand the pain and hurt we experience when we have to stand in the funeral service of a loved one. Reflect on the good old days. And yet still can't embrace them anymore. Because the only thing we have left are the members. Oh God, will you come by here in this congregation? Bring consolation and comfort to the family as they reflect on the hurt that this moment brings. Human words are insufficient, but you are all sufficient. So breathe upon your people now hope, strength, comfort. Yes, as we go through this service, it will serve the purpose of strengthening this grieving family, of helping and healing the broken hearts. And then we find strength in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm joined here this morning by Elder Michael Willis, first elder here at the King's Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he assisted me in directing and sharing this service. And so I will take the lead by announcing the first uh, lesson or the first reading, which is coming from Psalm 121, verse 1 to 8, and will be done by Clarice Anderson Cousin, followed by the second lesson, which will be done by Kyla and Gavin Campbell Cousins. We will take the items in that order. Please compare God bless you. Not by sight. 
We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. Ten and last. For, for we must all appear, appear before, before the judgment. For, for we must all appear, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Here ended the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. The remembrance for Ricky will be done by Mr. Denham Campbell, while the remembrance of Rick, former manager Julie from Secrets. After which, the other two items that I will announce are the tributes, song done by Elizabeth Hay, niece, song by Terence Lewis, friend. And the third item, Damian Moody. So the program will proceed according. Just before they arrive, for security and safety reasons, I'm going to ask that the main entrance be left free, just in case there is an issue where the audience of the main entrance. I'm going to ask that the main entrance, the seats are inside, so those who are standing, I'm going to ask that you make the Main entrance be free. Thank you very much. Mr. Denham Campbell or Aunt Julie. Uh, if they are not currently in the space, we will invite uh, Elizabeth Hay, uh, Dr. Terrence Lewis, and uh, Damian Mooney. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am not former manager from Secret, but uh, you have to be flexible, so I was called upon to help to read the tributes, and here I am. I know this must be a very difficult time for you. I'm sure your heart is aching. My heart goes out to you and family during this time. I know that words are inadequate at this time, at a time like this, but I truly wanted you to know how very sorry my family is for your loss. I met a Sonny in the year 2006 at Ibero Star, where he was a telephone operator and I became his manager. We then moved on to secret resorts and spas when a few of the team members from the front office at Ibero Star, Star left to secret resorts and called back asking if we would love to join the team. I said to my fellow co-workers, yes, I would love to. Later that evening, I told Asani about my plans to take up the offer. He quickly said, Bossy, I'm coming with you. I applied for the job as telephone manager and was called and later took Asani with me in the same capacity. Asani was the first telephone operator on the team with me at Secrets and we worked tirelessly with the technicians to 
put the PBS together as it was the first of its time in Jamaica. A son, kind-hearted, loving, very helpful, always willing to go above and beyond. He got along well with his co-workers and never frowned when asked to pick up an extra additional shift, even when called upon suddenly. He never forgets to bring my bowl of pumpkin soup whenever he cooks soup and forcing me to drink it up. No, bossy, come on. Drink up the soup, man. Bossy, you will drop down. You work all day. You can't feed on coffee. No, bossy, that's not right. Drink the soup. And I would have to drink some or else he would not leave my desk. Then he would go get me water, juice, and come in with some kind of snack. He was like a brother to my daughters and a son I never had. And he would be at my house as soon as he gets on as he gets an opportunity and was always talking about his case. He loved his case dearly. I miss talking to you, a son. Tears, tears, tears as I write. I don't have an answer as to why you were taken away so soon, but rest with your makeup, Creator. May you sleep in peace. Thank you.
turns.
Good morning again. Team, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. In memory of Asani Lawrence, a man who was truly great in every sense of the word, he would be sad to miss. My first impression of Asani was how he carried himself and how well spoken he was. Those who knew Asani would attest to his unwavering dedication to his family and his love for his children. I remember saying to him that I admired how he carried himself and he replied, Miss S, we have to put in the work, you know. Asani was also a very dependable person. He was the type of man who you could call on for anything and he would always be there to help. No matter what the task was, Asani would take it on with enthusiasm and dedication, never once complaining or shirking at his responsibilities. I remember once he went to post-mortem for our family and the family called to express how impressed they were with him. They even asked for him to attend the funeral. And this was almost all the families who interacted with Mr. Lawrence. He was a man who lived his life with great purpose and honor, always striving to do what was right, even when it was difficult. A man of action, where even in the darkest times, to full responsibility, he made a mistake. Hassan's integrity was unwavering and he never compromised his values or beliefs, even when faced with adversity. As we mourn the loss of this great man, let us celebrate his life and the legacy he leaves behind. Asani Lawrence will always be remembered as a man of respect, a man of integrity and love, who touched the lives of everyone he met. His memory will live on in our hearts, especially in the hearts of his family and friends, and the, in the many lives he impacted during his time here on earth. On behalf of the entire development of management and team, we express our deepest condolences on the passing on a man of action, a man of integrity, a man of respect, and a man of love. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you. 
glória do seu Deus. Nós vamos credited. E Paul Job Friends said before you in London. E Paul and Job that was very risky to take people from downtown into my community. And you all know, there are some who will wait to hurt others. So we give him credit for that. To transport people's children from school to home. I hope that you have made his calling an election show that those of us who are hopeful and is waiting for the return of Jesus will see his family, his children, take home. He has left a wonderful legacy. He said we have ministered to all the other churches in this conference where we have been services. We ask the, those who are mourning, those who are visiting, to support our country children. So on this time, we are going to sing mostly the song in your program. Sing the wondrous Lord of Jesus. And the ushers and the deacons will come around and ask that you give mostly so that others will be blessed. Those, uh, my members who are here, uh, you know my readers to see. So I'm going to ask the congregation, sing the wondrous Lord of Jesus. His mercy and His grace in the mansion bright and blessed, He prepared for us a place.
Titus. Eulogy for Father first, and eulogy for Son second. So I'm going to invite uh, both parties to hold it. Good morning everyone, eulogy for Brian Antonio Lawrence. We have a story to tell you today. If anyone came and told them, Miss Lurleen and Ma Mass Bobsey, this is how it would happen. Maybe they would not believe, maybe the path of land they traveled would never be crossed. Just maybe their meeting and relationship would not have produced the heartbeats that confirmed the life and delivery of their firstborn. According to Miss Lurleen Thompson Ellis, my mother, she's sitting there. Sunday, May 6, 1962, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy delivered by Mrs. Barrett, a midwife at home in Bickerstead, St. James. Being naive to the process and innocent to the task of motherhood, she quickly learned to nurture a baby boy who she named Brian Anthony Lawrence, otherwise called Ricky, Brockup, and Wallace. He was Bob's boy. I'm sure his father, Blanford Lawrence, was as proud as a hot chicken, knowing that after all the balls he has thrown, he is successful in hitting out the stone that he rocked into a man child who didn't make it, both, who didn't make it to six feet in height. They continued to share the joy until later in his childhood, he went to live with his grandmother, Miss Estelle Lawrence, Miss Mardi, a woman of a woman of valor who showed who show a great love to both Ricky and Steve. They both grew up with their grandmother, Miss Mardi, now deceased. She would ensure that they are cared for and attend Sunday school and receive a sound education. She would ensure that, sorry, Ricky was known to his family, his siblings, 21 in total, nine brothers, namely Steve, Dave, Henry, Dean, Basri, Carton, Andrew, Owen, Winston, now deceased, 12, 12 sisters, Peaches, Marvel, Maisie, Dawn, Simone, Donna, Marilyn, Carito, Debbie, and Jen, now deceased. Shelly and Gigi. As a young child, he lived with and was raised by his other mother, Miss Irene, Mommy, sitting down there. He attended the Bickerstead Basic School that was located beside, beside the old sawmill in Bickerstead Square, then to Bickerstead Primary School. When he was about six years old, he was a victim in a vehicular accident on his way to school. The sawmill was in operation and he didn't see or heard the people coming. In, the, in his hurry to get to school, because he was late, he crossed the road in a hurry and the rest is history. His knee was damaged, hence the name Rock Up and Tumbleton. A child's mind has a way to compensate through suppression or exaggeration. For when they experience painful events or anything that has been threats or harmful. So, you could imagine, 
that the mystery about the accident may have generated his inquisition into working on the element of his fear, that is, anything on four wheels. The source of his creativity was observed from childhood. There was a coconut tree between two breadfruit trees. The coconut tree has now died, but the breadfruit trees are still alive. Under the coconut tree was the pit. This was the hole that Ricky and Steve played in daily digging dirt. They used a bully beef that's currently eating to, put, to make the, the gradle. They took the spring from the whole spring bed that was leaning beside the toilet. The spring and the retrofit corn beef team were attached to a piece of board. This was then a tip of body truck they had made. They used this truck, this truck grader, to dig dirt from under the coconut tree. This interest resulted in his desire to learn the skill of auto body works. Ricky was trained by two of the respected members of the community, Mr. Lesson Owen Les and Desroy, known as Sonny. Every celebrity has a unique name. Well, Ricky, our celebrity brother, who all of you knew and sought after for his one-of-a-kind service and skill, was named among his tradesmen and many customers as Wallace. He was so named by a well-known man of unsound mind in action. Give Wallace anything on four wheels and he will pull it apart totally and make it over. Therein lies the thrill of his passion. According to Mr. Thompson, reported to Mami, the first thing Ricky put back on the road was Marshall's bus that had crashed. It was so damaged that the only thing that was left was the chassis. Ricky made a new bus and put it back on the road. When Mami married Babsy, Ricky and Brother Steve were under their grandmother's care. They were small children who quickly developed independence, wanting to do things on their own, like brushing their teeth and cleaning up after themselves. According to Mommy, Ricky had an eager eye for detail. He was not able to be as carefree as the other little boys around him due to the limitations of the injury he had. If he played marbles, gig, ring games, she never saw. But based on the effect of the accident, Steve acted as his protector. He would ensure that he was not mistreated by the bigger children. He would climb trees and pick fruits for him when they traveled to the bush. Steve said, I loved my brother dearly. He was a courageous and determined youth. He was keen on keeping things tidy and doing his very best at anything. Mommy's first surprise was when Ricky bade Mambo, who was only three months old. He was a baby himself. He had put her on the bed, soap her up with the rag, she walked in just in time to see him holding her back, getting ready to wash her off. He was always excited to take care of Mama, who remembered him as her babysitter. He bathed her, washed and combed her hair, made her porridge, and fed her. He was very industrious in the home, Jenny can tell you. He loved to cook. His rice and peas was always shelly, and coconut milk had to be well seasoned. Mommy bragged about her Sunday rice and peas, and she and Papa would usually argue about who taught Ricky to cook so well. The older community members would always talk about Mas Babsy to boy them. Their mannerisms were always on point. 
He was always respectful, especially to the elderly. He was well domesticated, we may say. In cleaning the house, he took pride in ensuring that all locations, whether you see it or in a seat, that they were polished, dyed, and well shined. If the other siblings did the other parts, he would be sure to take the shining. After he shines the floor, he used an old piece of felt or an old sweater and he would rub the floor and be sure to know that he's not rubbing it crisscross, he's rubbing it along the wood. Using the self-eater iron with the rooster on the handle was a task but his clothes must be well done. The collar, the break in the shirt, and the seams must be pressed. He was never pleased when things are not done to his liking. These qualities were still present in his adult life. He never shied away from washing, cooking, ironing for everyone at home or cleaning. His wife, Janine, was super surprised one Mother's Day she came home and found every single thing done. He was, Ricky was, and continued to be our guiding big brother. I want to ask you a question. You're here. Raise your hand if you've ever heard these words. And me and big brother, and me and big brother man, listen to me. How about this? Me love you. Me have to love you. Me love all of my brother and sister them. I just love you now. I just love. That's all we need. I just love. My brother, our brother, was a disciplinarian. His children can tell you. For any person in life to experience hurt by anyone, we must have experienced love from that person along this path of life. Even as adults, while we dream of in dream of with words many times, he had a very strong personality that was not always welcomed. We all know say, when people turn man and woman, we don't take nice to Dracos. But did he care? Yes. That's why he is anyway. Because I'm me, I'm me, Greta. You must listen to me. I learned early to listen and say yes, yes, we And move right along. Even if his instructions will not be honored. He had dignity. His word was law. We have to acknowledge when we are wrong and accept the consequences of our actions or decisions. In his last month, he folded to his little sister. I was talking to him about consequences, forgiveness, and letting go of hurt. He responded, you know what? Even though you have a little sister, you hear me? You come and you talk to me like this. You're right. Me I don't do it. Me I don't make amends. Forgive and forget. God is good. Is there anyone here who ever heard Ricky's name associated with trouble or wrongdoing? If you did, raise your hand. Okay, good for you. Because if you did, you would not have been invited to his wedding. Yes. Yes. About to leave me. There are trouble people. But you would have answered the pastor on July 2nd, 22nd, 1994, when he married the Lord his life. Married his Although he broke up, had a damaged knee. His ego, his pride, self-worth were not affected. He walked with the sexiest swag of his time. Right, Jenny? 
demanding attention and commanding respect. Our brother takes pride in his physical appearance. Nothing else for his ways, like after soon and Bell was black hair oil. He had to be slick. He was an avid player of cricket, just like his father. Did you know that our brother, son, father and friend, who stayed at home most of his childhood years inside the house, was a lumberjack, a cricketer, and a creator of amazing things? Ricky was living at Miss B, and Jen would pass by after work on a daily basis. Of course, Ricky saw and was intent on conquering this strong, firm, black woman. Well, they say small acts fall in tree. He did cut her down. He became her lumberjack. One day, Jen was on her way to Cambridge to give Uncle Pink a breakfast at the jail. He saw her and made his move. Boy, he was quick for a man with a leg. Jen made attempts to escape his wandering eyes and undaunted interest, but she was baited by her brother, Connie. Ricky went to visit Jen at her parents' home. He called. No answer. He called. Here, Connie. Jane said to tell you, said, she no there. <laughs> he never gave up. He went in hot pursuit of her. He continued chipping away at her hardened exterior, hitting her in the right spots. Then she cracked. His persistence is seen in many areas of his life. He was larger than life. And like the bow that breaks on a constant, persistent force, she popped and Ricky cried out, Timber! <laughs> he has fallen his tree. His beautiful lignum vitae was ready for the carving. This beautiful, extraordinary woman of the family Marley, Jenny, Christy played cricket with Ricky. Now you know that playing cricket, whether a rock robin or curry for cricket, will generate a lot of noise, right? Even though it's a gentleman's game. Now Ricky wooed her. He teased her. Cricket to play. He sent his balls at her. And guess what? He scored! The union created an amazing child, Asani, their firstborn, who was born during Hurricane Gilbert, followed by a pair of twins, Sashoy and her baby sister. On July 22, 1998, he made their union till death do a start. To Jenny, he was her husband, her sounding board. To Lurleen, his mother, he was a miracle child. To Sashoy, Brianna, Asani, and Kadoy, he was their father and friend. To his siblings, he was the eldest but shortest. He was babysitter, mentor, a supporter, a joker to us. His memories will forever be in our hearts. For example, he was Carita's first customer at 11 years old. He bought the first renter, which is Olbusha. She dug all by herself, but she's proud of it. She continued to find things to sell him from Obama's um, fancy. Come on. He was her advisor as an adult. He always has something positive to tell her. Jenny had stopped by their house after school one day and didn't tell mommy. He was upset that she didn't tell her parents. But before he scolded her, 
he said, I love you. This was her first I love you from anyone that she can recall. He had awakened that thrill that you feel when you're told I love you. For this, she is grateful. Our great brother never said no to Shelley. He never tell me no. When we went for lunch money, when I went for lunch money on a daily basis in primary school, because the $50 daily was not enough. He was a grandfather. He was a brother to 21 siblings. He was an uncle to many nieces and nephews here and abroad. He was a friend to many. He was a mentor to young body auto mechanics. He was a teacher to many who he had trained. He had the skill that many desire and the serviceman that delivered to many. But today, we, we say goodbye. He, he was our, our big brother, brother Rick, Ryan, Ricky, Brocco, Wallace, Antonio Lawrence. He, he was, was a son, a, a husband, a daddy, daddy uncle, uncle, grandfather, grandfather and, and the mayor's biggest, biggest cheerleader. He said goodbye on February 6, 2023. After being hospitalized for about two weeks, and today we all share in the story of his life. As we say goodbye, my love. May your soul rest in peace. Father. Such touching and soaring remarks. Uh, two announcements. One goes on my plate. The female bathrooms are to my left. Through that door, I can be entrance. They go alongside the wall. And the doors, you see them at all. For the male to my right, down the steps. Doors will be open. Uh, someone who drives a great Toyota car, license 8465FY, your luck is someone who needs to be on uh, this here. It's just a group Camry, in fact. Great Toyota Camry, 8465FY. You need to be clear and soon. Someone for me to leave uh, this space. Okay, Sonny, that's on. Anne Marie Christie will move towards the podium. I see on the program musical offering. Musical offering. If you are in this space, I will ask you to prepare yourself to come to the podium next. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll start by reading a poem I penned for my nephew, Sonny, and from there I will write into the eulogy. He played like a puppy, always happy. When he was next, you'd know on his face it would show. Helpful, kind, so loving, romping, shouting, always hugging. The women were the craze, he had them in a maze. He doted on his kids, did crazy bits, worked late, worked hard, never pulled a lazy card. His smile was contagious, laughter infectious. He hustled hard, hard did the yard. All the women, younger girls, big men, little boys, middle-aged ladies, kids with toys. Sonny, Sonny was all you heard, then he would say, don't say a word. Sonny, Sonny do what? That can't true. No brother, we go to school together. I him carry my sister. I wear my driver, my friend from call center. My little brother, long time co-worker. Son, father, brother, uncle, cousin, lover, nephew, grandson, Rick was the one. This gentle giant has now gone home and has left us all to mourn. 
Remember not the sad times, but the great ways in which you touched our lives. Sleep on in peace, Sonny. Eulogy for a Sonny Lawrence. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. A Sonny Jalee Lawrence, affectionately Rick or Sonny, was born Marvel Christie and Brian Lawrence on September 9, 1988. This give birth baby was the apple of his parents' eyes, especially that he is Ricky's firstborn. Ricky doted on his offspring. He took him everywhere and showed him off to everybody. As he grew, he meddled with everything, but especially was keen on cars. He loved books and was eager to start school formally. He attended Antobi Basic School, and from there he went on to Antobi Infant and Primary, where he sat the grade six achievement test. He was awarded a place at the most sought after high school in the West, the Herbert Morrison Technical High. While at Herbert Morrison, Sonny was elected class captain and was an avid band member practicing the clarinet. At the end of his high school years, Rick joined the National Youth Service where he received the training in early childhood education in Cobbler in Mandeville. Thereafter, he was placed at the Anchovy Basic School where he taught as a pre-trained teacher for a year. Immediately after leaving Anchovy Basic School, Rick went on a private hotel program in the United States, working as a houseman. At the end of his tenure in the U.S., he returned to Jamaica, where he worked as a telemarketer at NARS. His employment at NARS was short-lived. He then decided to pursue the passion of his, and as such, was enrolled at the Coral Automotive Training Institute in Flankers. There he received certification in auto mechanics and worked alongside his daddy Ricky for some time. His mother Jenny would boast how Rick can just drop an engine in a second and pick up back a one click to start up. Soon after, in his quest for fulfillment, Rick ventured into the tourist sector. He was in the employ of multiple hotels such as Iberostar, Royalton, Secrets, and Grand Palladium, where he worked in the front of the house as a PBX operator. Having satisfied that hunger, Sonny slowly slid into the taxi business. He plied the corner of Port Green Pond route, and that was when his name became a jingle. All one could hear was, Sonny, Sonny, Sonny. Everybody knew him, everybody loved him. As his friend Teron would say, Jano, the man coming on the street and making him and tell you. He was fun loving. This gentle giant and cuddly beer wore a contagious smile coupled by an infectious laughter. Fun loving, loquacious, helpful, playful, or rompy rompy, as you would say. He bothered the vendors at the taxi stand. They could not help but love him. At his last place of employment, the La Pena Funeral Home, he was dubbed the backhoe because of the fact that he single-handedly lifted corpses in an effort to expedite the hectic intake process. To have known Rick was to love him, and we are surely going to miss him. So, as he enters the other life, let us mourn less and celebrate more. Let us do so by carrying on the legacy he has left. Bury hatchets, listen more, talk less, forgive, say I'm sorry, love someone, hug someone, praise everyone, laugh, love, live, smile. It is the curve that sets everything straight. There is greatness in every one of us, and it behoves none to speak ill of the rest of us. In a quote by Miriam Williamson, it is not that we are inadequate, it is that 
we are powerful beyond measure. Sony is survived by children as Sonia, Khalil, Ajani, Zafir, and Kira. Girlfriend to Shana, or Angel. Stepchildren, Kennedy and Keanu. Mother, Janine. Brother, Kadoy. Sisters, Sashoy and Brianna. Nephews, Amir and Kamari. Grandparents, Egbert, Shirley and Lurleen. And a host of aunts, uncles, cousins, and well wishers. Rick, as you lie in God's grace and garden of greenery, may light perpetual shine on you. Rest in peace, Rick. We love you. We miss you. Thank you. Thank you, the item on your program musical offering. If the performers are present, then we ask you to proceed to the podium now. If not, we will proceed to our next phase of our Thanksgiving service. Uh, the audience of all participated, some are not, and some will definitely be touched by our next time. After this rendition, the sermon will be provided by Pastor Franz Chambers. He is the House Minister for the King's SDA Church. And I'm confident today that he will allow God to use it so that comfort, hope, and assurance will be delivered to the Greek family. So after this selection, voice that you will hear is that of Pastor Francis. Let me get someone in our new insurance. Okay. Oh, I'm working with the
consolation. The ride of the storm. The truth is that the storms will come. It is how we handle them that makes the difference. You know, it was a few weeks ago I did a funeral service here and the son was the driver of the hearse. I remember meeting this very professional gentleman who executed his duties with great dignity and class and professionalism. I saw him in the Sunday at the funeral. I didn't go to the graveside. Eloise went. And when Eloise came back, you know, he was telling me all that happened and so on. But on Wednesday, the police had a rehearsal for a police funeral to be held here. And just as I came to open the, the church for them to have a program, a son came in with the, the casket. And he almost jumped over the vehicle, saying, Pastor, I saw you, I see you too many times this week. But I just want to tell you that my father died on Monday. And I was so shocked that him being here on Sunday, he lost his father on Monday. But then in the pain couldn't get even worse. On a Sunday after the father's, after the police's funeral, I was right up here talking with Eloise and another elder. And one of them said to me, uh, Eloise said, if I remember the young man that drove the hearse, that his father died, that he died. I said, no. I said, the father died. And he kept on insisting that it is the young man who died. And I tell you, I left here saying to myself, this is not possible. It cannot be that just within a few hours, he would have passed. And I was made to understand that he died the same night after I spoke with him. I spoke with the police chaplain and he too was confounded. He, he too was bewildered at the fact that then he called back the men to come and pick up the casket which was then here and he asked specifically for a kid. They told him that he was no longer there. He asked. I don't know that I have words to provide any comfort to anyone today. But this one thing I will remind you of. God is here. God is able to give strength to the family. Mommy, I heard you were hospitalized and I wanted to know that you were not. Praise the Lord. We are praying for you. We are praying for you because we know it is not easy. We can't tell you we understand because it is not possible to understand. But God is here. This morning, I just want to take your attention to the book of Luke. Chapter 7. And if you didn't move, if you didn't get up and be, don't need a look. Now it's time for the sermon. So nobody move, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 11 through 16, says, And it came to pass the day after that he went to a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she, she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had a compassion on her, and said unto her, Be not. And he came and touched the beard or the casket. And they that buried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto you, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to 
to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us. And that God had visited his people. When a son is handed back to his mother is my caption. When a son is handed back to his mother, shall we pray, Father, this is your moment to bring comfort and consolation to your people. I pray now that your Holy Spirit will move through these pews and sit beside every family member. Bring from your scriptures life and light and strength and hope so that they will find the courage to continue. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There are hardly words that can describe the pain that comes with losing a loved one. It is difficult when a family member dies. It's difficult when a friend dies. It is difficult to deal with a colleague dying, but with someone who is close to you, who is intimate to you, it is difficult to deal with that reality. It is even more difficult when that person was someone who you could rely on, you can lean on, someone you could trust, someone you could confide in. When that person passes, the pain is immeasurable. And I will repeat that sometimes in a funeral service, there are two mistakes we make. We may come to the podium and say that we understand. You don't. We may come to the podium and say, do not cry. Because God understands, not true. God understands, yes, but it is impossible to argue theologically correctly that God doesn't expect you to cry. For even Jesus wept at the great sight of Lazarus. Even Jesus on Calvary's cross would have I stand here as a mouthpiece of God. I stand here as one who believes in the power of Almighty God. But I also believe that God understands when a person cries. And it must not be treated lightly. The Bible says that the Jesus was leaving the city called Nain. And he had, as usual, an entourage with him. Those who were invited, those who were called, referred to him as his disciples, along with others who were just enamored, who were just enthralled by the fact that Jesus was so powerful. And they were following Jesus in name. May I suggest to you that there is always a crowd following Jesus. May I suggest to you that not everyone who follows Jesus is really with Jesus. May I suggest to you that not everyone who follows Jesus is really interested in what Jesus has to offer outside of the fact that he provides fish and bread. But they were following Jesus nonetheless. And the Bible continues to know that when he came to the city gate, there was a dead man carried up, the only son of his mother. Bear in mind that in Jewish tradition, 
A body would not be kept for very long before it was buried. The body was carried on a somewhat of a gurney, somewhat open. It wasn't really enclosed. The body was lying still in the open. You could see the person being carried by the poor bearers. But, but, but what a way for you to have a funeral service. And on your passage to your funeral service, you intercept Jesus or Jesus intercepts you. What a thing when the funeral is interrupted by Jesus himself. What a thing when Jesus turns up at your funeral service. Well, you must understand that the last time Jesus went to a graveyard, it was when he went to the tomb of Lazarus. He turned up at the tomb of Lazarus four days late, and the weeping sisters were frustrated. The weeping sisters were disturbed that he took so long to get there. But Jesus told them that I am the resurrection and the life, and he that is turns up at a funeral service, things happen. When Jesus turns up at a funeral service, things change. It was an opportune meeting. It was a wonderful meeting that Jesus would come at a time when a mother, a widow, a grieving heart, a woman in great distress. You see, friends, Came up to the woman 
and said to her, we not. It may contradict what I said earlier, but you see when Jesus comes and tells you, we not, it's because he knows he's about to do something special. When Jesus turns up and tells you, don't cry, it is because he knows he's gonna change the situation in a very short order. When Jesus turns up and tells you, do not weep, it is because he knows that in him, there is a life unborrowed, underived and original. When Jesus turns up, he knows he has authority over death, hell and the grave. When Jesus tells you, don't weep, it is because in him, he has power to bring back to life the individual as much as he may be dead. When Jesus tells you, don't weep, Trust him. When Jesus tells you don't weep, it means that he's about to do something special. So the Bible says, he came and touched the casket. Mercy. That touch, I believe, was more than just the act of resurrection. It was a signal of his love and compassion for a grieving mother. The Bible says he touched the casket. And the young man stood still. The, 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 the bearers, the poor bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. Young man, arise. Now if that happened here today, many of us would have been out of the building already. But I want you to know, that Jesus understands the power of death. Jesus understands that when death grips a person, it will not unlock until he returns in his glory. Jesus understands that death brings a great level of finality. The Bible tells us that even a living dog is better than a dead lion. A lion might have been powerful in his life, but when it's dead, it is not as powerful as a living understand Jesus knows that death has some amount of finality and when someone goes into death unprepared he knows the pain that it brings not just earth but it brings heaven Jesus understands that death brings this sense of finality so he, he has compassion on those who have been affected the Bible says he touched the casket. I want someone to understand that Jesus wants to touch you today. It is not just the, the dead that Jesus is interested in. He is interested in the living. And he is saying to some young man today, to some young woman, arise. He is saying, get up out of your slumber. Get up out of your sleep. Get up out of your sins. Get up Pepsi says live for now, you have to live for eternity. 
You can't live as if you are dependent on your own abilities. You have to live trusting in the God who made you. Because it is not your strength, nor your wit, nor your power that woke you up this morning. It's not your alarm, alarm clock that brought you up here this morning. If it was your alarm clock, then you could leave some alarm clocks at the cemetery. I want to challenge you today to realize that God wants to give you back something. For that woman a name, it was her son. For that woman a name, it was that sense of support. For that woman a name, it was a sense of hope and restoration. But I want to suggest to you that what God wants to give us back today is our dignity that the devil has stolen from us. God wants to restore in us a sense of purpose. God wants to give us hope. God wants to give us a sense that one day he shall return and he shall live with him forever. The Bible says the young man sat up and began to speak. I want you to observe that how you went down is how you're coming up. The church is listening. How you went down is how you come up. This young man got up and he probably continued the conversation he had before his death, not realizing that, that he was dead. Somebody needs to know that when death comes, the next thing we will see is the face of Jesus. And every man will have to get up. Mm -hmm. Whether you are a sinner man or a righteous man, for the Bible tells us, that there is coming a time when God will say enough is enough. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. May I suggest to you that God is asking, God is pleading. God today is saying that we never know when our day of death will come. We never know when it will be our last conversation. We never know when it will be the last time we will say goodbye. We never know when we shall, we shall never get the chance to hear ourselves, hear our name on the news because we are no more. We never know when that day will come. So Jesus says today is the day. If you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. And God is making an appeal to arise. Get up and start over. Get up and start bringing support to those around you. Get up and start making a difference. Get up and start living your life the way God wants you to live. Arise, young man. Arise, young woman. Arise, gentlemen. Arise, lady. God is here in this place. And his power is able to resurrect. I really hope that in this moment of great sadness, in this moment of deep reflection, it will be a time when we will consider our condition and our status with God. So that at the end of the day, God will be very well pleased to say to us, come up from the grave. God will be very well pleased in calling us home. I challenge you, you are not too powerful to die. You are not too beautiful or bold to die. So I beg you, live for Jesus. For he is the life giver. And when he comes, he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. May the grace, may the peace of God Comfort you. May He provide healing to you in this difficult moment as you seek to trust Him to bring you through this dark moment. God bless you. Shall we raise your hands? You have heard the mouthpiece of God calling men to Jesus. We thank Pastor Chambers for such timely, encouraging, and uh, inspiring thoughts. 
I hope and trust that family members would have found hope that Jesus is still alive. And one day, death will no longer be in our space, but it will be annihilated. It will be removed, and then we'll have peace forever and ever. But as family members are decided to be seated while the congregation will stand as we confer the
reflector. Two we are shine bright and them a reflector. Want to know what we do and them a no director. Where them put shot in a the Oh, 
Ce pas ça vous dire pas ça je ça Je le cago
Bye, you have to go bye for the bye. bye.
you know. Sometimes to read now. Thank you. 
Let me see it, Mama. You know, you know, Lord, you can go and do anything and nothing big.